I'm the last of the old codgers, and very pleased to be here in person. Um, when Sara asked me to represent the past, I wasn't quite sure how to take that. Um, but I present to you this morning a completely random collection of uh, imperfect and highly subjective memories from the, the very early days of what became the Aerial Archaeology Research Group for the, the very early days of ARG. Um, I am a founder member, and as you may or may not know, I'm the only person who's been to every single meeting. So... <laughs> You might you might say that means I need to get a life, but um, it's been it's been quite a good life so far. Um, the, I have a, again a sort of random collection of of uh, illustrations as well. Sadly, nothing from the early days of ARG. There was one person who wandered around snapping photos uh, extremely annoyingly, but he can't. I'm not sure where he is anymore, and I don't think he could find them, even if even if I could find him. Um, the photos you 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 will see are sort of randomly collected over a long career, uh, mostly with permission, either formal or informal, uh, from a whole range of national archives, friends collections things that I've pinched from, from uh, pre presentations that I've done in the past and other people have done. So um, I, think we can, I think we can assume that all of the copyright things are, are covered. Um, and apologies for anybody's photos that I've pinched that didn't know and didn't want me to. Um, anyway, as all good stories start, once upon a time, once upon a time in 1983, when I'd been working for the English Royal Commission for six years, I received a magical invitation. Um, there are a couple of, a couple of points that probably bear reading as, as they came. Raj has talked about the, the, uh, the groups in 1981 and 1982, invited groups of archeological administrators, field officers, and research workers who met in Cambridge to discuss some of the problems associated with post-reconnaissance use of air photos. And this was a this was a meeting of oops, sorry. Oop, get back. This was a, there were two meetings of the great and the good. Um, heritage management professionals, department heads, big professors, um, and Raj. Because because he happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, I've, the, the, one on the, the one on the left is the very first group in 81, the real great and the good, uh, invited by Paul Ashby that uh, Raj, Raj referred to. And then the second meeting is the meeting in 82, uh, which was the, at, at, at which point the, the, the group had the idea for what became ARG. I have marked in brown the big heritage management professionals, um, almost entirely high up, um, high up man managers on, in, in 81. A few fewer in 82 and including um, including some PhD students and, and researchers. What I've also marked in 82 is the women. 
There were no women in the first group. There were a few more in the second group. And in '82, they'd been talking about an increasing number of individuals, often independently and in relative isolation, attempting to devise procedures which will allow them to effectively interpret, map, and classify the vast existing block, uh, backlog of such information. And so, oops, and this is, this is the magical gathering place to which we were invited, the Mond building in, in Cambridge. Uh, and Rowan Wimster, who issued the first invitation, and David Wilson, who had been responsible for um, assembling the, the two precursor meetings. But the group who attended, um, you can see that there are more women, uh, far fewer managers, department heads, senior professionals, and the bulk of the group, and the reason it was so important to me, and, and I think to everybody else was there, was this was the first time that they had actually assembled the people who were doing the interpretation and mapping, who were actually using the photos. And this was in 1983 in Britain, and it was, it was entirely Britocentric at the time as well. In 1983 in Britain, this was still sort of revolutionary to get the, to get the users and the workers together to talk about what they were doing and how they could, to share their work with each other and, and talk about how they could do it better, what it was they were looking at in the first place. Um, and so the, the first magical invitation went out to anybody who was interested. The people on the list that Rowan Wimster had been keeping as they passed through the Cambridge Air Photo Library, um, but, but actually invited anyone interested in joining such a research group to get in touch with Rowan and, and come along to the first meeting, which was held in September 1983. So, oops. Inevitably, of course, there were um, discussions of uh, photographic platforms and optimum uh, aircraft and how best to take photos, uh, coupled with, of course, uh, discussions of cameras and films and how to record, how to, how to plan and record reconnaissance to take photos. But the research group itself in 1983 started by looking at photos, remember those? Um, sorry, Raj, Raj had also um, referred to some of the earlier um, regional studies based on air photo evidence looking at various aspects. Um, the matter of time in the, in the bottom left-hand corner was the Royal Commission's recognition and wake-up call to the amount of destruction that was happening to archaeological features, uh, particularly in, uh, as a result of quarrying in the Thames Valley. Um, and there, had all, there was also, of course, David Wilson's handbook for uh, air photo interpretation for archaeologists, which came just, just before we met and really provided the first I would say the first comprehensive guide to archaeological air photo evidence in general rather than 
uh, features linked to specific periods and specific, uh, specific areas of the country. And mostly, at the first few meetings, we just showed each other photographs. Features from all over the country, things that people had found. We were looking, we were teaching each other and ourselves how to understand what it was that was showing on air photos and how we could make sense of it archaeologically. Um, all sorts of features from all over the country, all over, well, Britain, sorry. Upland and as well as lowland. And trying to understand the mechanisms for how these, how these marks that we could see were, were formed. We got, we had somebody who came and gave talks on crops and how they grew and how they reacted to different conditions, how you could understand what you were, what you were looking at. Um, different types of crops other than cereal crops. I mean, at the, at the time, um, there was a lot of oilseed rape being grown. There were lots of um, crops being grown that weren't cereals. And the, the received wisdom was, oh, it was cereal crops. It was wheat and barley. And other crops don't really, don't really show anything reliable. Well, that wasn't true. And we were able to, to look at the new uh, subsidy crops, the new crops that were, that were being uh, grown, and just to, to have a look at how the evidence appeared, what we could see, just trying to understand in, in many, many, many different sorts of scenarios, trying to understand what we were looking at. Um, and looking at features other than conventional prehistoric archaeology as well, which of course you can also see and you need to understand. Um, I refer to it here as new archaeology, of course it was, well it was, it wasn't archaeology when I started as an archaeologist, but um, industrial sites of, of various sorts, um, strain, all, all sorts of uh, military, military sites. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not explaining all of these. This is just a sort of a, an illustration, a, a, a random collection. And things that could confuse you with a, a medieval rabbit warren and an early 20th century golf course on the same site, looking in some sense, in some ways, very similar. Things that can trip you up. But we also talked about mapping and we've been through the, the series of different ways of depicting the evidence that you can see on a map in a way that you can describe it, publish it, bring together information from several different photos onto, onto one page. Um, we started out doing things by hand, tracing, measuring distances on photos, tracing things onto onto paper. Um, there were then mechanically driven um, transformation programs, if you like, which, which followed using stereo photos. The, the operator would steer a mark around the photo um, and, and the mechanically driven um, mechanically driven mechanism would, would produce an image. 
Uh, then there was compu the, the computer image, the computer supported transformation, which filled up an entire room. I think this was, this may have been the ordnance survey. Um, and then eventually the much more user friendly, portable, uh, usable. Um, desk-based computers that we're that we are familiar with now and we talked also about mapping standards and scales now of course now that everything's on gis and computer driven you don't really have to worry too much about what scale you're using you you need to think about how you're going to illustrate uh, features, I, I guess, but um, but there was a lot of argument about about what scale to map and how much detail to put in, and um, some quite bitter arguments from time to time. I don't think we ever really resolved everything. It sort of went round in circles, but that's that's okay. That's the way that's the way these groups work. That's what it's all about. Um, And all of this, of course, was, was trying to deal with individual bits of information on thousands and thousands of photos in, at the time, several different archives, box, shoe boxes of photos under the beds of private flyers. Um, it's, it's difficult to remember what it was like when everything was analog. <laughs> um, it was physical photos. It was individuals working in, on their own, um, in county archaeology units, in, uh, on on university research projects um, there were databases but each county had its own database and it each county's database was slightly different and, and anyway the databases were card index um, and everybody had a slightly different way of presenting things and recording things and describing things um, So we spent an awful lot of time discussing how best to describe in a meaningful but not too much of a straitjacketing way features about which you knew nothing except their outline and had virtually no hope ever of excavating because there were just too many of them. Um, and if you, if you put a really specific label on something and it turned out to be something else, the original label would probably never be lost and that feature would never be included in the list of what it really should be. So we spent a lot of time just talking about how to describe how to record, um, how to depict, possibly leading to standardization, but that was another topic of considerable contention and no particular, I would, I would say no particular conclusion in the end. Um, but we were able to to show photos and say, "I've got this. I've got this strange. It looks like a building with a couple of little annexes at each end. Has anybody ever seen anything like this? This was in Wiltshire. Yeah. Well, actually, as it happens, there are a couple of those in Shropshire, and we know 
in Shropshire that they're early medieval buildings. Oh, well, in that case, there's a fair bet that the one in Wiltshire is as well. And eventually somebody published a paper and there were a load of others. And again, you had to, before, before the wonders of the internet, when anybody can put up anything and say anything about it, you had to wait for the annual publication of a society's journal and you'd get um, published papers on work that had been done a couple of year, a couple or, or so years ago. You might get to see somebody's PhD thesis. It was really difficult at the time to, to synthesize and to, to bring together all of the work that was being done by all of the various practitioners. So that's, that was one of the things that ARG was really most useful for. Um, sharing knowledge, learning about what everybody else was doing. Um, finding out that your little amazing site was possibly not unique and possibly not even unique to Britain. But the most important thing about ARG to me always has been the way it has brought people together. From first all over Britain, then all over Europe and beyond. year after year, teaching, training, meeting, passing on information, becoming friends, talking about techniques, um, going out into the countryside and looking at stuff on the ground just to remember that some of this is, is, has a, has a three-dimensional aspect. And really, ultimately, it's, it's been the fellowship. Um, it started that way by meeting the other people in Britain who were doing similar sort of work. I mean, just to, to flash back one final time, I worked for the English Royal Commission. We had a team of six people working on aerial photos. Most, most everybody else in county archaeology units and university departments had one or two people working on their own or, and, and in isolation and working on what was mostly regarded as a sort of weird fringe interest. Um, and so once a year, we could all get together and I mean, we're the critical mass here, aren't we? <laughs> it's not a weird fringe interest. Um, and anyway, that you know, I could, I could burble on. These are the, the 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 fevered reminiscences of a, a very old one. Um, but it is the fellowship and the friendship and the sharing of information and knowledge, and seeing new people coming along seeing people who arrived as PhD students now retiring as professors with students of their own. What? I, I, I do feel sometimes like a, not, a, not a grandmother, but a great grandmother. So that to me is, is, is what ARG has always been about, will always be about. So that's enough of the past. I would only like to say happy birthday, Arg, with lots of love from me. <laughs>